Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on creative ideas for activities for our residents with dementia during the COVID-19 pandemic, brought to you by the California Partnership to Improve Dementia Care. I'm Dr. Jennifer Burtzall, a licensed clinical psychologist and the clinical director for CHG Behavioral Health Services. So a few quick disclosures, um, you know, this presentation, certainly it is not comprehensive. There are a lot of really wonderful creative ideas out there. So this really is to just, you know, provide food for thought and give you some suggestions on how you can improve and maybe increase your pleasant events and activities to your residents during this really difficult time. And the ideas that we're showcasing in today's video, they have been collected from multiple Dementia Partnership members. And these strategies are coming from the creative ideas of our members, but also from different webinars that we have attended or ideas that have been shared with us from owners or activities directors from various memory care facilities or long-term care communities. And as we go through, you know, you will see some different ideas or even some products or companies that have been shared with us. And so we do want to offer them so you guys can see different ideas and, and resources that are available. Um, but you know, the partnership, we have not vetted any of these and we're certainly not endorsing any specific company, product, service, activity over another, but we did wanna share the different ideas and opportunities for activities that we came across. So why are we even creating this in service? Why did we feel it was something important to think about activities? Well. As we all are well aware of watching this webinar, you know, the reduced formal recreational activity, socialization, and certainly not being allowed to have in-person visits from family and friends have been some of the most devastating aspects of this pandemic on our residents. It is essential. We need to keep our residents safe. We need to keep them healthy. We need to do what we can to reduce, you know, bringing the coronavirus into our buildings and causing any type of infection and spread. But we know that it has been a huge emotional impact um, for our residents. And so as their care providers, we all need to work very, very hard to think about pleasant events and activities that they can do independently in their room as they're socially isolating so we can really support quality of life and emotional well-being. And so how do we do that? Well, we're gonna talk today about how we can get creative. We're gonna give some, some suggestions in terms of how to get that thinking cap on and problem solving ways to be pretty innovative around activities. We wanna talk about our resources. How do we tap into different resources, including connecting with volunteers and other people from afar, which certainly involves using technology and some other uses of technology. Um, and then we really wanna make sure that as we think about activities, we're keeping it under the umbrella of person-centered care. So going back to the basics of really knowing that individual, what activities are meaningful for them, but also considering their stage of dementia. What are their thinking strengths? What are their thinking areas that they're struggling with so that we can make sure that the activities are appropriate for them? And also that we support them in having pleasant events and activities in light of their dementia. So not relying on their memory or their initiation and motivation or their concentration, that we become their healthy brain, we become their memory, we become their planning and problem solver to make sure that they have pleasant events and can engage in them. And then throughout all of this, always considering infection control because that's huge, right, as we think about how we're integrating activities in a new individualized room-based way. Okay, so getting creative. Um, this can go on and on forever, right? There have been some really innovative ideas out there about how to um, you know, increase activities and pleasant events in this very difficult, challenging time of residents staying in their room. And we're just listing a couple of them here to keep this a more realistic time frame of a webinar. Um, but some creative ideas include have you thought about giving residents a plant if they don't have plants in their room that they're responsible of taking care of, that they need to water, that gives life, or even stepping it up a notch, possibly giving them a goldfish or something pretty simple that they can have on their bedside that they have to feed and that puts some life into their room and gives them a purposeful activity. Um, one thing that I thought was pretty creative that one facility told me they did was they actually hired 
the music therapist that was kind of an independent contractor providing music therapy to multiple facilities. Well, we're not bringing in right outside consultants a lot of the times. Um, you know, those are not really deemed essential, but they actually hired her to be a formal employee of only that building. She wasn't going to any other buildings so that they can actually have one-to-one -one music encounters and music with individual patients as part of their plan of care, which I thought was pretty interesting. Another facility shared with me that they actually bought in bulk card tables, so larger tables, right, small folding card tables um, for each resident, and they were like $20 each or a little bit less in bulk, so that their residents could have their own table. It was infection control. They weren't reusing them, but for residents that loved painting or needed more space, that it really wasn't functional to do that on the little kind of dining rolling card table that we have. Um, they were able to do that, and then they could fold it up and kind of leave it in the room or leave it open where residents can put out puzzles or different things and have that activity. So I thought that was really wonderful. Obviously, it depends on space and safety issues, um, depending on the way the rooms are laid out. But if that's feasible, that seems like a really wonderful idea to increase space for activities. Um, and then you can get more ideas from connecting, again, with other facilities, other activities director, other um, you know, interdisciplinary team members. I was informed of a Facebook group that came out that has over, I think, 4,000 members, and it's called Activities Directors Sharing and Caring During COVID-19, and I'm sure there are others. So we want to share our ideas with, this, with each other because there's some really great ones out there. The other thing that might be helpful is, you know, we've had to stop a lot of the formal activities and social activities. Can we think about the activities that happen every day that are part of the routine? And is there a way to make them more special? Can we make them a bigger deal? Can we add some oomph to those activities? And one that um, came to mind from one of our partnership members was making mealtime more special. Um, this is a huge loss. You know, we have some residents that maybe didn't engage in all or many of the formal activities um, from the recreation department, but they did go to meals. And meals are very social. People sit with you know, other residents that they get to know. They often sit with the same residents at each meal, so they know them very well. It becomes a really important part of their day in socialization, and that has been taken away. So for example, is there a way we can make mealtime more special? Right? Can we make it a bigger deal? And of course, residents are eating in their room for the most part, so how do we do that? Well, can we include fun menu printouts with descriptions of their meal or trying to make things a little bit more fancy or more of an event, right, of eating that meal in their room. Um, you can consider, you know, giving, you know, buying bulk like just little plastic vases um, and then getting flowers on Friday and putting one flower, one stem in each resident's meal tray so Friday becomes a little bit prettier and more special and then they can keep that flower for the weekend while it lasts. Um, you can print out fun trivia facts about the food being served, for example. So, um, for example, if you were serving sweet potatoes, you could have a little printout that says, did you know that North Carolina's official vegetable is the sweet potato and that February is National Sweet Potato Month? Or sweet potatoes are high in beta carotene, which is an antioxidant and keeps the eyes healthy. You're gonna to wanna to fact check that. I created that fact myself by just Googling, so those may or may not be true. Um, but that's an example. That might be cute or humorous or make the meal a little bit more fun. It might start some conversation between roommates. So just getting creative and thinking about how can we take those routine activities that were still occurring throughout the day and make them a little bit more exciting. Another idea that was suggested was you know, creating a resident cookbook. And so in that aspect, you know, you can have someone ask residents about their favorite meal or recipe, which in and of itself can be a really fun reminiscent activity as you go through that. You can ask family members to send in the recipe. And as you create this cookbook, you know, you might have stories plus the recipe. That's something that you can print for each resident to have. They can look through, it can be really meaningful. Of course, you need permission from each resident. But then to even take it up to the next level, perhaps you feature one of those favorite recipes 
once a month, you know, you have that be the meal or one of the meal options or every other week, twice a month. And again, just during this time of COVID when we have to get creative, making certain activities more special. And so having ideas like that. The next thing we want to do is tap into our resources. And I think, you know, our family members are probably the biggest resource we have to help us during this time. Um, I know that, you know, family members and friends, they are hurting emotionally too. It is so hard not to be able to see their loved ones and hold their hands and be there for them during this time. It's it's really something that's impacting the family members in addition to the residents. But a lot of family members have been doing wonderful things, even though they can't come in person, mailing in or dropping off supplies, activities, special treats, photos. And so we definitely want to encourage that to continue. That's a wonderful source for us to provide, you know, individualized pleasant events to our residents. Um, but if even if a family member can't send things in or mail things in, we can ask them to email um, photos. And so this way we can keep our residents connected to their grandchildren, to their family. We can invest, let's say, in a photo printer and print those photos. We can start albums for our residents. If we're getting photos, we can print them so they have them. That can become an activity in and of itself, looking through those photos, having staff member talk to them about their family and talk about those photos can be really wonderful. And I think, you know, we recognize that not all residents have family members and friends that have the means to send things in or even have family or friends that are that we know of that are available. And so what one of actually my CHE psychologists did, which I had never heard of, but I was super impressed by this when she told me the story, she actually started an Amazon wish list for her facility residents. And so um, residents would go on and say that they wanted certain art supplies, paint supplies, whatever it is that they were interested in, books. Um, and, you know, she listed all of those different things, like the residents wish list, and then family members and individuals for the community were invited to purchase those so that they could not only give to their you know, loved one in the facility, but also support some of the other residents that maybe didn't have access to family members. So I thought that was really wonderful and something you may want to consider in your organization. The next thing that has been really wonderful is how many individuals are volunteering their time. And of course, it's not on site, but I have heard about volunteers that are reading stories via Zoom or reading stories to residents over the phone and spending time with storytelling. There have been a lot of high schools and high school students that are volunteering to do Zoom chats or FaceTime or Skype chats with nursing home residents so that they can have conversations and have that social Socialization with somebody. Um, and, you know, if we don't have the technology, you can even just go back to paper and pen letters and snail mail and having pen pals and, you know, th thinking of different high schools or organizations where people can write letters and think about when, what you feel like when you receive a letter or a card in the mail. It's such a wonderful experience to open that up, read it, and then write something back, right? That's another activity. So those can be um, things that we can start that would probably be wonderful even after formal, um, you know, our recreation activities are open back up again because those those connecting moments are are pretty powerful. Certainly, we've used a lot of technology recently. So as we just talked about doing those Zoom calls with high school students or using technology to have a storyteller, we can incorporate lots of different activities that way. Um, I think what's been most meaningful is having those FaceTime calls or Zoom calls or Skype calls or whatever it is with family members. Um, I've had clinicians that tell me they're connecting the residents with family members in Israel or other countries, which has been really special, not just local family members. So really any Zoom-based activity, um, but also, you know, thinking about just videos and having access to YouTube or other resources where, for example, there was a long period of time um, where most sporting events, you know, they were canceled, they weren't um, being conducted. So if you have a resident who really loves sports, they can go back and watch, you know, really um, famous past games or different sporting um, YouTube videos. We can play those for them. So just getting creative if someone has an interest that had been stopped for some reason because of COVID, 
not forgetting that we can't go back and play videos of that from the past. Um, and there's a lot of organizations and companies that do have remote activities as their product. So I'm gonna go through a couple here. Again, um, these are not anything we vetted or you know, that we are endorsing over other activities or companies, but these are different resources that were shared with our partnership. And so we wanna make sure they're available as examples of um, companies and products that you may be interested in. And so the first one is Televisit. And so this is a company that has, you know, friendly group calls, and this really supports social engagement. They do have an option that can be video, so you can have that video conferencing, but if you don't have the resources to provide residents each with some type of device or smart device, they actually have um, a process where they can do phone only, so audio only, where they can call the resident's phone, they can do reminiscence groups, music type groups, connect individuals, so that's pretty creative, and if you're interested, you can contact Wesley Chang and the telephone number and email and website are listed here, um, and if for some reason my Zoom picture is covering it, you can just click on the PDF of the slides that are available in the resources as well. So here's some information about the different type of activities they can do, as well as the monthly costs. Um, I've also heard of Music Men's Mind. So this is you know, a Zoom-based sing-along, which can be really fun if individuals have access to a device and wanna join those times. Um, then there's you know, Birdsong, which this is a tablet that you can purchase that's already pre up um, different things are already uploaded or it's designed for older adults so it has videos music games but also ways that you can connect and do video chats with family members right from this device and so you can learn more about that and watch the demo video on the link provided and then finally um, leading age california actually also has um, a grant which is the inspire quality of life improvement project which you have to apply um, but this grant, basically what it does is you get this, if you see it here, it's a pretty impressive looking stand and tablet that again has uploaded different activities and resources for older adults. And the idea is really to support, you know, a person-centered approach to their interests, but by having different types of apps and services that are available via this technology. So if you're interested in learning more, you can visit the Leading Age California website link, which is provided, or also um, you can go to It's Never Too Late, this link, and I think it actually shows you a little bit more about the technology. The next thing we want to consider when we think about activities for our residents with dementia is the dementia process itself and really think about, you know, what are their thinking strengths, what do we want to tap into, but also, you know, the different types of thinking deficits that occur in dementia, memory trouble, um, executive function, frontal lobe trouble, concentration difficulties, and really consider that as we're thinking about person-centered care planning for our activities. And so the first thing is memory. Um, we want to be their memory. We want to be their healthy brain. We want to be their problem solving and their concentration and, and supply that to them. That's something that they're struggling with. And so our residents with dementia, they may have a family that sent them an amazing care package full of different activities, painting supplies, art supplies, puzzles, books. But if they don't remember that those activities are there or where they're located in their drawers, that's not going to be helpful. So we want to remind them and say, would you like to do painting? Your daughter sent you know, these three books. Would you like to read one? Which one? And make sure that we're reminding them of the different activities that are available. We also wanna make sure we help the residents set up that activity. They could have painting supplies right in their line of sight, but it actually, if you think about it, it takes a lot of steps to set up painting. And one of the deficits or thinking impairments that occur in dementia is what we call executive dysfunction. This is the frontal lobe, this is our problem solving skills, but it's also what helps us in terms of organization and all of those steps and initiating, actually having motivation and starting an activity. And so if you think about getting those art supplies, setting them up, having the space, getting the paper, getting water, all of those things that we might need, that can be overwhelming for someone with dementia, which then prevents them from using it. So we might think, well, they just don't wanna paint. It's right there. If they wanted to, they would paint. That may not be the case. So we wanna make sure we're helping set, set the residents up and get them going. 
We may have residents that struggle with concentration and paying attention. So they're going to, you know, fatigue and kind of, you know, tap out of a particular activity pretty quickly. And so we need to change those activities up more quickly. And so if that's the case, if you have someone that really does struggle with concentration and maybe gets bored or gets distracted easily, we may want a care plan for them going in every hour and changing the activity and offering something else to set them up with. So we might start with, you know, art, something art or, or some craft supply they have, and then an hour later, see if they'd like us to put their TV on or play their radio, and then an hour later, ask if they'd like to look at their photo album and give it to them and set them up and so on. We want to make sure that we are not trying to give the patient an activity or engage them in an activity that's beyond their thinking capability, beyond their cognitive capacity. That is going to frustrate them. It is going to become not a pleasant event, the opposite of a pleasant event, and certainly isn't going to be worthwhile or improve their quality of life. And so we wanna be mindful of that. If we have a lot of different activities that were available in you know, our recreation room, and we're just kind of bringing them to different residents, not just kind of putting down a puzzle or you know, a crossword book or something that's kind of above what they're going to be able to accomplish, that would not be good. Um, on the other hand, we also wanna remember that residents at all stages of dementia can get pleasure out of certain activities. We just have to find the right activity. So if we have someone that has severe dementia, we don't want to assume that they don't need activities. That would also be an inaccurate and really harmful assumption. We can maybe do things in that situation that are more sensory based, aromatherapy, you know, little hand massages with lotion, different things that tap into more somatic or again, sensory stimulation. So we wanna make sure, you know, we're kind of right in that comfort zone where something's not too difficult for the person, but we're also finding things that they can enjoy. And when we're offering choices, it's wonderful. We always wanna offer choices. It really helps people feel in control and feel like they have purpose and that they're part of their care planning. As we get to certain stages of dementia, we wanna limit those choices to two or three most. So again, it doesn't become so overwhelming. You know, would you like to do you know, painting now or would you like to watch the television? So that they can certainly pick and have that choice, but it's a manageable choice. So those are some very specific considerations around dementia. And then similarly, just like we want to think about activities that's specific to that particular patient and their level of cognitive impairment, we want to be, you know, person-centered throughout the whole process of thinking about activities for that resident. We want to make sure that the activities we offer them are really individualized and meaningful to that patient, that they are actually going to enjoy it and want to want to participate in it. So how do we do that? Well, it really starts with knowing the patient's life story. You know, what are their interests? What were their hobbies? What did they do for work? Did they have kids? Were they a parent? You know, do they like animals? Do they have pets? Knowing that information so we can really tailor activities that are going to be of interest to them. Certainly, we're going to do that by asking the resident, him or herself, but even if the resident has more um, advanced dementia, they're a poor historian, they don't remember what they did for work, well, we can get that information, hopefully, from their family members or someone that knows that person. We don't give up. We want to reach out to family and ask those questions. So again, we can try to think about more person-centered and personalized activities. So here, you may already have something like this or have a different um, template, but these links, these four links provided here are life story templates. So they're actually like little storyboards that ask questions you know, about the person from, you know, what name do they like to be called? What nickname? Where were they born? Again, what do they do for work? Did they have siblings? What were they like? Do they have children? They're all a little bit different. Some look like a book. Some are more like an interview um, question answer. But you may find these helpful to really thinking about getting those life stories of your residents and using them to inform your activities. And then we wanna think about infection control. So this is super relevant during the pandemic. This is why we're having this issue to begin with. We've stopped formal activities to make sure we're doing good infection control and we're limiting the spread of COVID-19. So what are some things we wanna think about even as we're focusing on more individualized activities? Um, you know, a lot of facilities will have different resources, especially memory care units where we have individuals with more advanced dementia, like baby dolls, that's been something that's been really um, 
uh, can be very helpful for some of the residents who enjoy holding the baby or reminiscence about being a mom. In that case, we wanna make sure we have a baby doll for every single one of the residents that used that doll or enjoys the doll. They each have their own. We're not sharing it. We're not passing it back and forth between residents. So this is true for any type of activity or toy that we may be using or any type of like, you know, um, anything that's really just tangible that we use. If we can get into purchase more of them and individualize one that stay in that residence room and it's just for that resident. Um, one thing I learned in a webinar that I attended around infection control is that um, if you're going to be doing some type of singing event, um, this is probably not so much for our larger nursing homes, um, but certainly for our small memory care houses that have about six residents living with them that are still convening in a much larger space, but just practicing like the six feet social distancing rule. Um, singing is actually causes the same droplets as coughing if someone's projecting their voice and singing. So um, that was something that I thought was useful information from infection control. We don't want people in enclosed spaces singing with each other. Certainly if they're doing something like we said on those um, you know, remote-based Zoom, they're in their room, they're only in kind of their space, it's fine to sing, but certainly not in any type of communal space, even if they're very far away. We don't want to do that. Um, and um, in one uh, webinar I attended also, this was of a six bed residential kind of memory care home. They actually were having residents still join in a communal area because they had a very, very large space and they had these six residents that lived there like very, very far from each other. And what they did was kind of similar like that card table. They had a space for each resident where they could do activities or watch a movie and that table became their table forever they made it like home they put you know pictures a flower but that was their space and they were always at the same exact table so I thought that was a good idea um, we definitely want to help residents if appropriate wear PPE wash their hands frequently that can be challenging for residents with dementia um, so one recommendation that we received was that for residents if they're going to do something like maybe walk you know, if, they, if we have someone that really needs to walk, maybe has wandering tendency that might be using, let's say, what was the dining room, you know, at certain times of the day to, you know, kind of be able to pace and do some laps for a while, to try to get them to wear a mask. If they don't tolerate a mask, a face shield may be easier for them because it covers their face, but it's not touching them. And what I thought was also a cool infection control idea is that, um, you know, helping patients wash their hands. If, if they don't want to stand in front of a sink, you can't get them in front of the sink. One facility said that they actually ordered those um, towel warmers that you kind of can, you see at the nail salon that makes the towel really nice, it's kind of hot water that steams them. And so they would do that with clean towels, make them really nice and warm. They're a little wet. They would add hand sanitizer and let the resident really clean their hands really well, but it felt like they were at a spa or, you know, on like an airplane where it was a special treatment and that they had more success of frequent hand washing and that via that um, method. So just some creative ideas that we've come across. And then finally, you know, I attended a webinar with Dr. Helene Calve. She is the Deputy Medical Director for the Orange County Healthcare Agency Communicable Disease Control Division. And she recommended that in our facilities, our residential facilities, that we should be cleaning frequently used surfaces every two hours. So these were things like doorknobs, handrails, um, but at a minimum three times per day and sanitizing them. And so that's probably more frequently than we um, did obviously before we were in the pandemic, but really, really um, being conscientious of, you know, disinfecting our surfaces much more frequently. And lastly, what we'd like to do now is just quickly go through some activity considerations, different creative ideas and suggestions that have come our way. The easiest way for us to organize this was to think about different categories of activities, right? So providing relaxing activities or cognitively stimulating activities. How can we connect with others? Thinking about moving and exercise. Our residents are in their room. A lot of times they're in their bed. Um, they're not walking about. So what are some creative ways to get them moving and feeling good? How can we stimulate the senses? And then those simple moments. So we'll go through those and then we'll end our webinar. Relaxing activities. Certainly music, 
any type of arts and crafts and painting, um, you know, tea, just having a cup of tea, having a cup of coffee. So bringing those throughout the day and allowing people to have a, you know, a hot beverage, maybe while you're playing some relaxing music. What could be cool is if you do have residents that are engaging in more crafts or painting is consider, you know, taking photos of that and printing a monthly pamphlet of the artwork and sharing that with residents. Maybe not everyone wants to do the art, but they can really enjoy looking through the art. And that can make, you know, creating a little bit more exciting for residents if they know it's going to be shared in some way. So again, that's that creative process of making things a little bit more special and, you know, taking it to the next level. In terms of cognitively stimulating activities, of course, puzzles, reading. Um, you might wanna do trivia of the day, right? So hand out a piece of paper and then you can over the loudspeaker or, or share it in some way the answer. So that can be fun. You know, you can't have group trivia, but you can find ways to think about some of the activities that we used to do, bringing it to the patients, bringing it to their room. Um, word scrambles are fun. And you may even think of things that they can earn prizes. Um, we know patients love getting prizes, that's why they loved bingo, it's super fun. And so is there a way for them to earn tokens or prizes? So if you did things like trivia of the day or you gave them a word scramble and they got it correct, could they kind of hand those pieces of paper back in or their answers and you know, with every, earn tokens or earn stars and with ever so many, they're able to select a prize. So that again, you know, finding ways to somehow bring things back to their normal routine or give them the type of um, stimulation and excitement that they used to have in a more creative way as they're isolating in the room. Helping them stay connected. So FaceTime calls, phone calls, some facilities are doing visits through the windows or some other creative ways to be able to see loved ones in a very um, social distancing infection control method. As we said earlier, writing letters, sending photos are so important. And you know, be willing to go the extra mile, be willing to print them. You know, family members can't mail them out, just ask them to email you and you print them for the loved ones. Let's see if we can, you know, do that for our residents. Exercise is difficult, obviously. Um, we're not kind of coming together with recreation and doing Tai Chi and different things, and that's hard to do on a one-to-one -one basis with every resident. Um, but, you know, being outside is important. I think when the COVID-19 pandemic first hit, you know, we didn't expect it to last this long. We really kind of kept everyone to their rooms. I see now more and more facilities having outdoor time. They're finding ways, especially now that kind of staffing is back up and they're having all their staff return where they have enough staff to kind of monitor and take, you know, just a couple of residents out at a time to walk, to be outside and then kind of have shifts. So we, we do want, you know, residents to get fresh air. We want them to have a change of scenery. We can make that happen. We certainly want residents who are ambulatory and feel that they want to move their body to have a safe way to do that, but also monitoring infection control. Um, you know, if there's ways to help residents exercise in their room, like if we can get them or their family wants to bring them two pound dumbbells, that's a safety issue. It's something you'd have to decide for each resident. But if that's something that they can do, um, that's something we can do. Certainly, you know, encouraging stretching, maybe giving them a handout um, and a reminder of ways to stretch their body and pictures, all of those things we can do to make sure we're encouraging movement. And then stimulating the senses, right? So this is really wonderful, even for residents who have advanced dementia. There's, um, I just put here, you know, the senses, it's not just smell, I, I focused on smell and touch here, but it's smell, taste, opportunities for snacks, different flavors, touch, seeing, hearing. Um, certainly aromatherapy is a big one because, you know, that's, we know it's soothing, it's relaxing, and different smells can be really pleasing, bring back memories. So there's different ways to do that with lavender and pouches. Um, but lotions too, we can get lotions that have different scents and provide those with the residents that they can kind of feel good. And although we want to be careful with infection control, even doing with gloves, you know, um, once in a while, just massaging different lotions into someone so they get that touch, um, they get that human connection. We can try to think about ways to do that safely as well. And the last thing is simple moments. Sometimes when we think about activities, we think that they have to be grand or big or like setting up a painting station. And, you know, pleasant events and activities 
can be small, like looking at a photo or just, you know, when we're taking care of a resident, asking them to tell us about the new photo. Who is that? That's your granddaughter. Tell me about her, you know, while we're getting someone dressed or, or doing our normal routine. So looking at photos, just having a snack, hearing a joke. Um, you can do joke of the day, right? So not every resident's going to value that, but when we think about um, the meal trays, maybe you put a joke of the day um, or have that. And so, for example, I just Googled a website for basically PG jokes, and I thought these three were funny. You know, I couldn't figure out why the baseball, why the baseball kept getting bigger. Then it hit me. Or what happens to a frog's car when it breaks down? It gets towed away. How many tickles does it take to get an octopus to laugh? tentacle, right? And you can just print that out and share those with residents. So let's get creative. Let's have simple moments. They all add up. All these little moments of pleasant events, you know, makes the day better, improves quality of life and well-being. And that takes us to the end of today's presentation. Um, we hope that you found this informative and that you have some new ideas or strategies to take back to your community. We want to thank all of you for the amazing work that you're doing. It is no small task to try to think about pleasant events and activities on a person-centered level during this time where our formal activities, social activities, family and friends can't visit. It is no small task and you are all going above and beyond to really support your residents during this time. So we wanna say thank you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. My email address is listed here. And of course, I wanna thank the entire partnership, but um, certainly the work group that worked on on these webinar series um, in particular for all their contributions to today's activities presentation, which includes Dr. Dolores Gallagher Thompson, Dr. Timothy Gisicki, Peggy Franklin, and Dr. Julie Futrell. So thank you all and wishing you all the best. Thank you.